Welcome to the Power of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Cultural Practices and Healing webinar. This is a webinar that is an event that's organized by the by SAMHSA's Office of Behavioral Health Equity in collaboration with our Ohana Center of Behavioral Health um, Center of Excellence on Behavioral Health for AANHPIs. And so, as we see the room fill, I can see how many wonderful people are. Um, joining us from all over the continent, as well as the islands and other places. It's really great to see um, everyone uh, sharing where they're hailing from um, in the chat. Uh, we have 99 plus um, greetings from people from different parts um, of the world. So welcome. Um, I'm Kathleen Wong Lau. Um, I am the uh, project facilitator for um, the Ohana Center of Excellence on Behavioral Health for AANHPIs. Um, I'm also a university diversity officer um, at California State University East Bay over in the Bay Area. Um, I'm going to share more about the Ohana Center later um, in the broadcast, but I'm going to quickly state what the um, webinar learning objectives are. And this is important for those of you um, who are um, wanting to uh, get uh, continuing education credit. So um, first, we're going to learn about applying cultural frameworks central to building trust and community engagement in behavioral health care services and support during times of community crisis for ANHPIs. We're gonna gain literacy on key cultural concepts of health, community identity, and wellness for ANHPIs. And we're gonna hear on the ground experiences of building behavioral health support using these principles during the continuing recovery and healing in Lahaina, Maui. Um, we're going to go over some logistics first before we start. Um, so all attendees will be muted. This is a, a webinar style. You'll be able to participate um, through um, Q&A. We have closed captioning that's available. Um, and so it's important for you to um, uh, click on that for you. It is available. We encourage you again to share Q&A questions. We have people behind the scenes who can answer some uh, simple sort of logistics questions or uh, details about logistics. And then we will have a Q&A towards the end where we will have panelists answer more in-depth questions. Um, we have hashtags for the events today as well. Um, and those will be shared, I believe, in the chat with you. Um, and so if you hear something interesting, you like what you're seeing, please, we encourage you um, to post on social media. I want to give you a trigger warning um, for the topics in the event. Um, we want to encourage you to um, practice self-care as well as gentle care with each other in chat. Um, should uh, people express that they're having a difficult time, we'll be talking about some events um, and crises that have really hit close to home for many in our community. Um, and so I'm now going to share the continuing education a language that we um, have on this webinar for those of you that are interested in continuing education credit. Um, Papa Ola Lukahi, as our project partner, has been designated as an approved provider of social work continuing education contact hours by the National Association of Social Workers Hawaii chapter. Uh, Papa Ola Lokai maintains responsibility for the program. This training has also been approved by the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol, and Drug Abuse Division for CSAC, CCS, CPS, CCJP, CSAPA credit. While both credentialing bodies are nationally recognized, we recommend folks check with their local credentialing body to make sure that they will accept these credits. For those wishing to claim continuing education credit, the link for your attendance verification will be dropped in the chat at the conclusion of today's session, as well as sent via email uh, the following day for, for when, because you registered um, for this webinar. Uh, upon completion of the form, you'll receive an email certifying your attendance and credit hours, and this will serve as your credit letter for licensure. So um, if you have any uh, other questions, um, there are emails that are at the bottom of these slides for you to contact. It also was dropped into the chat if you want to cut and paste that. Okay. So um, what we're going to do now is um, I'm going to um, welcome uh, someone to from our Ohana team um, and also an important member of our community, um, Illinois Kawahikawa, um, and she'll be sharing and opening the space for us today. So welcome, Illinois. A he he a ke i ano la e na ohana, ua mai ole o ka aina malie. A he na ni vale no i ka makaloha, e i a ka hile oe, e pane mai ho i la aloha e aloha e. 
हलो हे ये ये ईलो <laughs> Mahalo, Lemai. Now, um, I'd like to, um, it's my honor to make an introduction um, for someone who is doing a great supporter of Centers of Excellence, as well as the work in Lahaina. Um, and I think um, many of you know uh, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman and have read about her work and support. Um, she is the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use um, with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and uh, it's really an honor um, to welcome you to make opening remarks. Welcome, Dr. Delphin Rittman. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending upon where you're joining from. Uh, you know, I have to say it is a, such an honor to be here today as we celebrate uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in May. Uh, this event was so thoughtfully organized and put together by the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Behavioral Health Center of Excellence, uh, or the Ohana Center, as you heard. Uh, and is also supported by our, our SAMHSA Office of Behavioral Health Equity. And it serves as a testament really to our shared values of centering community voice and cultural wisdom in our work. Um, each year at SAMHSA and across the country, we celebrate these important heritage months and, and we just believe it's essential for us and especially in the field of behavioral health and public service uh, to embrace and understand the richness of diverse cultures, their cultural histories, experiences, and contributions to our rich nation. Uh, and as we reflect on the wisdom of today's presentation or presenters, um, let us remember that Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities have unique histories, strengths, experiences that warrant individual attention and respect. Uh, last year, I remember visiting Maui in the aftermath of the devastating wildfires. And it was overwhelming really to walk through the devastation of the fires and to see the loss of homes and livelihood and sacred landmarks and uh, the total destruction of the, the town at Laihana. Uh, it was profoundly moving and uh, to see the tremendous loss. Uh, it was also though profoundly moving to see the way the community uh, really came together and uh, rose up on the occasion to, to draw upon cultural healing practices uh, to begin the recovery process. Um, today's presenters are exemplary leaders in their respective communities and roles. Um, their stories are not just inspiring, but they are guiding pathways for how we can approach crises anywhere. Um, we'll hear from representatives from the Ohana Center of Excellence, uh, SAMHSA grantee. Uh, and we're just so pleased that this is the first ever center focusing on the behavioral health needs of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander population. Um, a major focus of the Center of Excellence is training and technical assistance to increase provider capacity, to deliver culturally appropriate care, conducting community assessments to determine the level of focus and need, and maintaining a repository of culturally and linguistically appropriate evidence-based and behavioral health resources and products. We'll also hear from community leaders who started a grassroots organization to reclaim and promote Native Hawaiian practices among indigenous families, enhancing their emotional and mental well-being. Additionally, we'll hear from representatives from one of the winning organizations from SAMHSA's first ever Behavioral Health Equity Challenge and last year, we held uh, the second ever challenge and awarded $50,000 to 10 organizations for their innovative uh, outreach and engagement strategies that increase access to behavioral health services for racial and ethnic and underserved communities. These presenters, uh, each in their own way, demonstrated how healing begins with cultural understanding and practices in their communities. 
Um, so in closing, I'd like to thank all of the presenters for sharing uh, with us here today and for being here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's joined us uh, for this webinar. And I look forward to the engaging discussions and the valuable insights that will be shared. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce SAMHSA's representative from the Office of Behavioral Health Equity. And would like to welcome Victoria Chow, the project officer for the Ohana Center of Excellence. Uh, so Victoria, I'll turn the floor over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Delphin Rittman, for your thoughtful words, leadership, and support in advancing behavioral health equity, and for taking the time to see firsthand the behavioral health needs, challenges, and successes experienced within our diverse communities. Welcome and thank you to all those joining us today from across states, oceans, and territories to celebrate this May Heritage event. I'm a social science analyst within the Office of Behavioral Health Equity, and as Dr. Delphin Rittman said, I am the project officer for the Ohana Center of Excellence. Today, I have the privilege of introducing OBI, a policy office within SAMHSA that has a mission to advance equity in behavioral health care. Our work is guided by three key principles, centering at the margins, using equitable data, and highlighting community voice to ensure policies and programs are tailored for and by communities. Today's program reflects these key principles. SAMHSA's data show that disparities in access to treatment do exist. Data disaggregation is needed and there is a need for us to do better. Data show less than 1% of people admitted to substance use treatment in 2021 were Asian, and the same was true for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, despite 8% of Asian and 20% of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander adults estimated to have a substance use disorder. Similarly, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders have consistently had the lowest rates of mental health service utilization compared to other racial groups. Additionally, CDC data show that suicide continues to be a concern in these populations. In 2022, suicide was a leading cause of death for Asians 15 to 24 years old. And for this same age group, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders had the second highest rate of suicide following American Indian Alaska Natives. As the data show, the need for behavioral health services among these populations is evident. Today's programming highlights the importance of culture and community in one's journey to healing. Though we will hear specifically about Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander cultural practices, the information and concepts shared are relevant to many other populations. We will hear about tailoring programs and practices in behavioral health to increase engagement and retention and the bi-directional nature of cultural learning. So let's get started. I'll pass it back to Kathy, our esteemed moderator for today. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and um, really appreciate all of those re opening remarks. So as promised, I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about the Ohana Center of Excellence. Um, I wanna share that for all the reasons that were stated by Victoria and also Dr. Delphin Rittman, we are um, a center that serves not only um, behavioral health care providers, but also people directly in the community. So we also work with community-based organizations and because it's important to build the capacity for, cult, uh, for behavioral health care providers, but it's also important to get people into health, uh, behavioral health seeking behavior. And so when you go to our website, you'll be able to see that we have um, visuals and the way that the website is set up that is usable by the general public and not just people who are behavioral health care professionals. Um, so our center of excellence is in its second year of operation. Um, and during this month, of course, it's important for us to look at where we've been, what we, you know, where we are right now, where we're headed. I want to share the most important thing about our center that I think guides our work is that we use a decolonial framework. Um, we are purposely decolonial in that we recognize that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders often in ANHPI or AAPI initiatives are often sidelined or reduced to cultural um, practitioners and, and performers rather than providing a lot of the really important intellectual content um, that's important for a center like ours in providing technical support. So, um, so the journey of our center is a decolonial project, one where we intentionally methodology methodologically deconstructed and reconstructed our COE's design work products, working relationships and organization to address the inequities in resources, research, infrastructure of knowledge generation, representation and visibility of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the behavioral health space in relationship to Asian Americans. Um, so our important message is that inclusion does not always equal equity. You've got to be purposeful, right? So I want to remind people that there's the growing use of the term um, Pacifica, which 
reflects a push within the community to recognize Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders as distinct from Asian Americans. We resist as a, as a center of excellence of, from lumping people together. Um, this is harmful not only for Asian Americans, um, but also for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. We have a very culturally specific framework that we work with, whether it is language, cultural practices, as well as historical um, inequities. Um, and we also are inspired by um, critical theories uh, that really look at strategic essentialism, working together collaboratively for a common cause at the same time, not erasing each other's histories. And so we take seriously the NHPI within AANHPI. Um, and so what does that look like in our, uh, in our center? That means that we have um, partners um, equal partners between higher ed universities, and you'll see the partners on the bottom, as well as, um, for example, uh, Papa o Ola Lokahi, as well as the State Department of Health in Hawaii. We did this purposefully. So I'm a co-PI, but the PI is actually um, over in Hawaii so that we make sure that we are not, again, um, marginalizing Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders um, because we have a lot of work to do together. Um, our retreats also reflect that uh, constant decolonization. So um, just wanted to share that and hope that provides inspiration and a roadmap for those of you who are doing this work. Um, I want to um, briefly talk about um, a little summary of um, framing of the Lahaina fires. And so as shared by Dr. Delphin Rittman on August 8th, 2023, a wildfire, wildfire began in Lahaina, Maui um, that spread to affect over 3,200 acres of the island. Um, and as the former capital of the Hawaiian kingdom, Lahaina is a significant historical and cultural site for Native Hawaiians. Um, though known to many non-Native Hawaiians at, in the continent um, as quaint tourist attraction, Lahaina holds a deep meaning within the history of colonialism and industrialization um, that has been played out in Hawaii. The Lahaina fires are the latest catastrophic event driven by climate change and made worse by generations of ecological mismanagement, which impacts indigenous communities all around the world, not just in Maui. Um, as of late as April 2024, more than 4,000 people were displaced by the Lahaina wildfires. We're still living in hotels. Many of them are no longer. We still have about 1,000 people. That was a full seven months after the fire blaze. The fires displaced more than 5,000 residents, um, destroyed 2,000 homes and businesses, and killed 101 people. A dispor disproportionate number of those people were elderly. Um, behind these numbers are children no longer in their homes and schools with their friends and familiar teachers, loss of personal property and items, multiple generations sharing hotel rooms without kitchens, a loss of employment. The displaced are also grieving for the loss of family, um, neighbors, and the land and symbolic capital of the historic sovereign kingdom of Hawaii. It is in this context that intensive behavioral health services had to be delivered. So our panelists today will not only be talking about responses to the Lahaina fire, but really talking about culturally appropriate, as shared by previous speakers, culturally appropriate um, and culturally informed ways in which we work on the important issues of behavioral health services um, in a way that is not only um, respectful, but effective, but also encourages people to continue health seeking behavior. Um, and so today, the overview of the agenda is we're going to have live presentations from five pre presenters, um, followed by a Q&A um, session. Um, so we'll have an hour of presentations and then a Q&A session. Um, and so I'm going to start by introducing um, the speakers. Okay, so our first speaker we have heard from already today. Um, and that is um, Lilinoi uh, Kawa Hikawa. Uh, she's the project manager of Ohana, uh, the Ohana Center of Excellence and a program coordinator at Papa Ola uh, Lokahe. And then we have Kumu Kanoilani Davis, who is the executive director of Hoakamana, um, Kumu Hulo also, and a, a Kahu Pono in Native Hawaiian Healing Arts, Hoakamana. Uh, John Oliver is the project director for um, the Ohana COE. He is a public health program manager um, in the Maui County branch chief. Um, and then he's, which, which is with the Hawaii State Department of Health, Ka'o Ohana um, Olakino. We have Kamaili Luke, who is a wellness navigator coordinator at the Hawaii State Department. He works with um, John. Um, and then we have Nikki Wright, who is the director of Ho'akuola, Hale, and, um, sorry, Malama Recovery Services. She's a staff psychologist and faculty at Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center. Okay, and so we're gonna start um, by um, having our first speaker, which is Lilinoi. Thank you so much, Lilinoi. Aloha nui kako. O Lilinoi ko hikawa ko uinoa no hilo no pi'i konua mai au makumoku o piawe. 
um o mauna wa ke aku mauna o wailuku ku uvai a ia ku ma ku mo a lo a ke ole ka hala o ola aloha nui everyone hello my name is lily noi pohi kawa i am from hilo from the um afu pa pi honoa on moko ke ave or hawaii island um, I bring with me into this space um, Mauna Kea as my mountain source and the Wailuku River as my water source, which are sources that have always um, helped to ground me uh, no matter where I am. Um, and especially in these virtual spaces, I like to stay grounded. Um, I am a person with lived experience in um, healing through substance use and, and mental health issues and justice involvement. So I'm very excited to be here with you folks today to share a little bit about our project. Um, next slide, please. I'll be sharing with you a little bit more about what the Ohana Center of Excellence uh, provides. We are an amazing online resource for empowerment, education, and support for both individuals and providers, as well as for families and communities all across the country. Um, our resources are really rooted in culture, language, and indigenous knowledge, and that is incredibly important. And we understand that our the communities that we serve, our Asian American, our Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, um, are not monolithic, right? We're vast and diverse. So our resources really aim to reflect that diversity. We provide the, a lot of different training opportunities, free um, culturally tailored training and technical assistance, along with a continuing education credit for those who work in the fields of substance use or behavioral health. Um, and we have an ever growing resource library that's available on our website. Um, I believe they put the link in the chat that you can go ahead and explore and look for resources by region, uh, by topic, by culture, by language. We have a lot of different downloadable tools and links to other websites with, um, with more resources that we've tried to bring together in one place so that um, they're easy for folks to access. We recognize that there are not a lot of resources that are culturally tailored to the communities that we serve. And um, so we're doing our best to curate lists of uh, resources that already exist and identify places that we need to uplift and create more tools uh, to serve our communities. We have an incredible network of uh, regional and national steering committees who help to guide our work by helping us to better understand the diverse needs of each of our regions uh, throughout the country and the unique communities throughout both the continental US, Hawaii and Alaska, and the Pacific Islands affiliated with the US. And so we continue to grow this network. So, um, you know, I know a lot of you folks are on here today joining us. So if you're interested in joining any of our steering committees, or um, if your organization or community is interested in joining any of our referral networks, please go visit our website under the contact menu and, um, and connect with us. Please also join our listserv today to uh, be able to stay updated on all of our offerings and follow us on social media. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, Papolo Lokahi is a partner, um, or Kathy mentioned, I guess, uh, that we are a partner. And I serve as a project or uh, the project manager for the Center of Excellence, as well as a program coordinator for substance use and mental health projects with Papolo Lokahi. Papolo Lokahi is the Native Hawaiian Health Board. And so Papua Lokahi was authorized by the Native Hawaiian Healthcare Improvement Act, which was originally passed by Congress in 1988. And our mandate is to raise the health status of Native Hawaiians and their families to the highest possible level. And we do this through our strategic partnerships, um, programs, and public policy. And we also serve as the body with which federal agencies shall enter into consultation with around issues of Hawaiian health policy and Hawaiian health care. Uh, next slide, please. We also oversee the five native fine healthcare systems, and you'll see on the map on the right hand side, um, there's one on each of our islands throughout Hawaii that provide direct services to our communities. Um, and we house many different departments, which you'll see on the left side, uh, that we utilize to serve our Kanaka Maoli or our native Hawaiians and their families throughout Hawaii and the continental US. Um, and now we are finding that more than half of our native fine population live on the continent. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, right? Cost of living, uh, astronomical housing prices, uh, limited housing options, and a lot, a lot of other factors. Um, so we really aim to serve our Kanaka Maoli and their families wherever they may find themselves. And you can scan the code on the screen as well to check out our website. Um, next slide, please. And I think it's important, um, I share with you a little bit of background about Papa Ola Lokahi to share why um, we are really excited to be a part of this project. 
Um, through the Center of Excellence, we're able to advocate uh, for the importance and understanding of the unique histories, experience, and needs and strengths of each of the cultures that we serve. And while Papalolo uh primarily serves Kanaka Maoli, we are honored to have incredible um, pilina or relationships with our Pacific, wider Pacifica Ohana. Um, and so we, we want our Pacifica Ohana to be a part of these conversations along with us. So our organization assists with bringing our Pacifica voices to the table because we know, again, that the Pacific is not a monolith. We are the people of Oceania, uh, Pacifica, Moanuia, Kea, um, you know. But again, our histories, our experiences, our needs, and our unique cultural strengths are vastly different throughout the Pacific. Um, and through our work through the Center of Excellence, we are uplifting these lived experiences throughout each of the cultures and communities that we serve, creating space for these stories to be told. Um, and we're really excited to be doing this because as Kathy mentioned, a lot of other um, AA and HPI projects and programs were often, um, were often forgotten or we often have to take a back seat. And we're really trying to do something special through this project. So we are um, incredibly proud and excited to be able to start to share these stories in these spaces. Next slide, please. Now, why it's important for us to create space for these lived experiences and these stories to be told um, is because each of us have these unique experiences, right? And I'm gonna share a little bit uh, from a, a Hawaiian perspective. And uh, you know, if we had all the time in the world, I, I wish that we could take uh, a walk through each of the cultures that we represent. But as you know, the AANH parent umbrella is, is quite large. Um, so I'm gonna use Hawaiian culture to, to paint a picture for you, to show why it's so important for us to um, focus on each of these cultures independently. Um, so, I'm going to share a little about a little bit about Hawaiian history. Um, if we look at cultural and historical trauma, right, this aspect is different for each of the cultures that we serve. Uh, for Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiians, some of the issues that have impacted, created this cultural and historical trauma that impacts behavioral health today, um, are rapid depopulation, which um, in Hawaii, prior to Captain Cook's arrival in 1778, we had about 400,000 to a million people here in Hawaii. Um, two years post-contact with Captain Cook, one in 17 Native Hawaiians had died. By 1800, the population had declined by 48%. By 1820, 71%. And by 1840, 84%. By 1840, we had less than 40,000 Native Hawaiians left. Um, foreign exploitation, our exploitation of labor, land, and all natural resources, cultural conflict via so forced assimilation and acculturation, uh, criminalization of the native identity, making cultural practices such as hula illegal, right? Um, banning Hawaiian language in our schools and in our homes. We had adoption of harmful foreign ways through forced imposition of Western concepts of land ownership, which led to massive land dispossession, data points. And historically, our people had no concept of land ownership and tended to lands as a member of our own family a relationship that can be traced through our genealogies. Um, land division um, enacted through Western notions of private property ownership led to huge dispossession of lands for Native Hawaiians who were forcefully removed from the lands that their families had tended for many generations and forced them to move into more populated areas, shifting from subsistence living into more capitalistic systems. Um, we also had uh, the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. So in 1893, uh, cool, uh, staged by a group of mostly American and European businessmen and politicians with the support from the United States government, which um, this group was often referred to as the Committee of Safety for any history um, historians out there, um, orchestrated the overthrow of Queen Lili Okalani's government in, in Jan January 17, 1893. And so this group imprisoned our queen and the coup ultimately paved the way for the annexation of, of Hawaii by the United States in 1898, an annexation that was vehemently opposed by over 90% of Native Hawaiians who signed the coup petitions to protest annexation. Um, next slide, please. Now, cultural and historical trauma affects multiple generations and are linked to health disparities in every culture. But as you can see through what I just walked you through of Native Hawaiian culture, that is very specific to Native Hawaiian culture. 
uh, Samoan culture has a very different um, cultural and historical trauma picture, right? And so it's important to understand and know that history and how it impacts the people that you're serving. That is why it is so important to not necessarily stick to this AANHPI um, umbrella term, but to rather to um, whittle down and, and look at each culture independently and uplift the unique cultural strengths within each of our cultures and uplift the unique experiences of each of our cultures so that we can create meaningful healing pathways. Uh, so the remedy for this cultural trauma, the cultural and historical trauma that has been linked to health disparities is cultural reclamation. And so what does this look like in our communities? Next slide, please. So um, as the center of excellence, we often function as a bridge to the community. Um, and so through our partnerships with different organizations and um, for, from the perspective that I'm sharing today uh, through Papua Loloka, his involvement with the center, um, I'm gonna share a few examples of what this cultural reclamation can look like in our communities and why it's so important to uplift what is, um, what is working in our communities and listening to communities. And I'm gonna center a little bit on the response to Maui just uh, because I, that's kind of how we're, uh, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great example of how uh, a community banding together is, is um, an important part to uplift within the way that we respond to uh, behavioral health crises and disasters. So we recognize that a culturally grounded response is preferred in our communities. And the importance of supporting and uplifting that work is really what's working in our communities. The lived experience is crucial to include in all of these conversations and decisions. Uh, what we also recognize that um, it's also important to financially support cultural and community efforts wherever possible. And the most important response um, is not telling communities what they need or showing up and inserting oneself, but instead to listen to what the community is saying and what they're asking for. Or observing the community's response to one another and supporting, again, what is working. So some examples of this that we saw that were just absolutely incredible. Uh, um, and I won't, I won't talk a bunch about it because she's one of our speakers today, but um, she, the her, you know, culture, culture is healing, right? And she, um, uh, Kanoi knows, right, that this, that culture is healing as a protective factor for, for so many things. And so she utilizes um, her, her, her um, cultural healing efforts in a way to uplift that within the community. Kula no na poeo Hawaii, how donation drives and took supplies to homestead communities that were affected on Maui. Um, homestead communities are very, very tight. Um, and uh, Papa Kolea Homestead has done some extensive work um, conducting needs assessments and native Hawaiian health needs throughout homestead communities in Hawaii. Uh, next slide, please. Kavika Espili, um, a traditional healing practitioner, provided over 30 hours of lomi lomi to 60 folks impacted by the fires. Uh, he traveled around providing both mele, which is music, um, and many other, and, and and um and lo me to these to these folks free of charge of course um because he knew that uh traditional healing practices is what spoke to the inside of these people and that was how to help heal them um on the inside uh lao lao solutions believe that uh providing the community with access to the land and traditional foods would greatly help to address um, addiction issues and mental health issues um, and then we also have, oh, next slide, please. Our Ohana Resource and Cultural Affairs, our Mauiola. Um, so through partnerships with Huino Kiolopono um, and many, many other Maui-based partners uh, created these uh, resource fairs to help um, folks that were impacted by the Lahaina fires to navigate through what healing and recovery, uh, finding housing, employment, mental health, um, insurance, uh, resources, and, and so much more. Um, through our vast network of uh, any, the NHPI 3R team, which was the COVID response team, to help reach uh, those communities that weren't reached. And through these experiences, we really learned that it, what, why it was so important to create more culturally resonant spaces where people felt safe showing up, right? And not not feeling like they needed to fit into any sort of box. They could come into a space that 
they could be their authentic selves in order to find help and healing. They could participate in healing practices and get connection to healing resources that spoke to them. Um, because, you know, healing often looks different for a lot of our communities. And that's an important thing to understand. Each of our cultures has different healing practices. And so we need to be able to respect that and have those resources available to connect folks to. Um, and what we love about our vast, uh, our vast network of, of our Native Hawaiian and Pacifica folks is that, you know, we are all connected to one another and Asian Americans too. We're all connected to one another. The ocean, right, is what connects each and every one of us. And I think that's a beautiful kind of metaphor to remember that we are not separated by the ocean. We are connected by it. We are one ohana. And while we do have many similarities, we also have many incredible differences that don't separate us, yet they make us unique and they're important to recognize and uplift, and especially, especially as we heal. Um, so I want to just mahalo everyone for joining us today. And again, you know, if if this if this type of project resonates to you and speaks to you, please, please, please reach out to us, join us. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Mahalo. Hello, I want to welcome uh, Kumo Kanoalani. Thank you very much, um, Illinois. Aloha, my kako, wao o Kanoalani Davis, my Moloka Inui, Ahina Mayao, no Kamilo Loa, ku Aina, no Kamako, ku Mauna, no. Kalohi kai aloha mai kako ola. My name is Kanoi Lani Davis. I come from the island of Molokai Nui Ahina. It's a small island um, here in Hawaii. And we serve uh, the state of Hawaii as well as our families and uh, friends on the continent uh, that are Native Hawaiian as well as Indigenous. Uh, I'm the executive director for Hoakamana, the Kumuhula for Kapahula Ohina Kapola Ilai, and the Kahupono um, in Native uh, Healing Arts here on the island of Molokai. Welcome. Next slide, please. I wanted to share a little bit about what we are doing in Maui. Uh, it is at the forefront of our work right now to heal and to get folks back to their optimal well-being, back to where they were before the fire started. Uh, nobody had an, any idea of what this was going to do, what this is doing, and what um, what this the undertaking would be. And so we knew that as Kanaka, as uh, Native Hawaiians, and the Native Hawaiians, because Lahaina is has a lot of Native Hawaiians in the small area that it's in, that we knew that going in with the Native Hawaiian perspective and view was, was more helpful. And the reason I say that is because that's how we went in from day one. And we and I was able to observe while inside the needs, uh, assess and observe uh, what they were going through uh, and, and slowly figure out what they wanted. And it was just in the silence of giving and paying attention and listening. And that was the catalyst to everything that came from there and the work that we started after I left Lahaina and came home to work on EMS, their emotional, mental, and spiritual well being through a, a Native Hawaiian cultural view. Uh, so I wanted to go ahead and share a little bit about what happened in Lahaina. Um, next slide, please. Before I go into that, I want to share a little bit about Kwakamana. So we are a native-led, uh, indigenous-led uh, nonprofit organization here in Hawaii on the island of Molokai. Uh, we center health and culture, and that could look very indirect. That could look very non-conventional in, in what we are what we normally see, right? Because with culture, it it's an indirect approach of work at working with somebody. Um, 
you could call it strength based, uh, but you could just call it living your culture and getting to know who you are again and finding yourself again and connecting yourself to what was lost. Uh, as we had shared earlier, there, the reclamation of culture is important to our own healing. Uh, without that, we're unable to start the process of getting optimal health. And so we continue to dig into who we are and where we come from and reconnect to the land, reconnect to our language, reconnect to the things that were taken from us abruptly and find the light in that. And that's what has helped us move forward. So uh, go on to the next slide. I'm gonna share a really quick video of the women of Lahaina. We had uh, six participants in our Ho'i Nana Ike Ola program, and they were able to learn their healing methods through chant, through Oli. Um, and these are some of the basic Oli or basic chants you would learn if you're in Hawaii. Uh, but we, what they didn't know was the, the depth of it, the healing of it. And so they were able to go into this. It was a six week course where they got to kind of be free. They shared what they were going through. And these women that you see on your screen, they happen to be neighbors and they all lost their homes. Well, majority of them lost their homes together. So you can only imagine uh, that bond that they have now based off of this tragedy uh, that happened in Lahaina. And so these women, uh, they opted in and, they started the, the journey to heal. And this healing was the catalyst to their voices when it came to legislature, when it came to policymaking, when it came to bringing their community together. And in that, they were able to find their why, their reason. And that was the biggest part of this journey was remembering your why. Because when everything is burnt and you are left with nothing, you forget your why and you forget who you are because everything has disappeared. So I'm going to take a moment um, and have them play the video and enjoy. <laughs> Being a part of Lahaina and as a, a Koopa of Lahaina, we've gone through a lot. Um, but I think that my Kupuna were calling me to come home. Although there was loss, that was like needed to clear the way to actually bring me home to who I was. I think I wasn't like um, fulfilling my purpose. I was scared and frightened, living in the fear of like, I don't know if I'm enough. I don't know if I am ready. Um, and this hui, this cohort of women, I believe was the kupuna, speaking through kanoi and through the hui of women um, that I surround myself with to say, it's time, sis, like time to come home. And so um, that kuleana, I think, is fulfilled through this. Kanoi and what she has created for us in Lahaina, the women in Lahaina, to bring us together to Oli and to bring us back to our Kuliana. And that is why we're here, is because Kanoi and Uilani co procreated to bring us here. I was enjoying just being, you know, because all these past um, months. It's been six months almost since the fire happened. There was no time for just space of like being. It was powerful because when you plant a tree by yourself, you are already building that pilina. But we all planted three trees together. And what that means for us is that one, we went ahead and said, we're ready for kuleana. Two, we know we're coming back and we're gonna always have to live in our kuleana. And then I think the third one for me it was creating a unity between Maui and Molokai because when we planted, it was the wahine, yes, from the haina, but then the uncles came around us and they made sure to aloha us. And that just felt unity and like we were protected and we were good. Stepping into 
um, the tarot patch is like health it's that wellness because it's like that all around circling of exercise that spirituality that duality like all the things um really revives you it revives your spirit and so that's what it was for me it, it was that revival um but most especially like right when we were done the ua like right before you know the ua started to come down and like you know paste up on our faces and i felt like that was like an anointing to be like you guys are ready like this is the time to now take this back home and hola and move on and share that hope with other people so i truly believe humans we have kuleana to nature and molokai has really shown us today the give and take the pilina that we must build nature gives but we have kuleana to nature nature will always malama us and take care of us if we malama and take care of every piece of nature as well maui is so grateful we are not lahaina strong we are maui strong maui nui akama and where we are lacking we got to be totally just enraptured by the beauty of what could be if we are dedicated and in devotion to this path that was prepared everything about this was like taking us back to like who we are as a people as a as kanaka hawaii as um resilient people that no matter what like you just thrive through pono never forget your mana never forget that your mana is within you and you bring that mana and the mana around you amplifies when you know your mana it all amplifies you gotta be alone kanoi teaches me you gotta be the outsider you gotta be the weirdo and you gotta be the leader that goes first ceremony is not for hello ceremony is not only for formal schools, but it's meant to be in the homes, it's meant to be on the beaches, and it's not about, like, we reclaim our space where the tourists have taken over. In Lahaina, everything is extracted, but through our embodiment and our medicine, we are reclaiming that. And what will move forward, what we saw as we looked over Lahaina, as we only in Hanako'o, that there will be a line of wahine across Paina that we just quietly come, we know, we listen, and we fill in the gaps of all the hurt, of all the misunderstanding, of all that was lost because we are the portals between the realms through our own bodies. And that medicine is here and it is ancient and it is nothing we have to earn. We just can just be, is be, that's our, <laughs> When there's times that's going to be really, really rough for you and you want to give up and you don't see the future, just remember these moments. And I keep telling you folks, that remember these moments because this will be the peak, the beginning to us to come. Hello, you can go ahead and stop the video. Thank you so much. Uh, so that was a little glimpse of um, what we did with the women in Lahaina. Um, every time I watch it, I, I cry. And, and the reason for that, other, aside from, you know, knowing, you know, where everybody came from is this deep understanding and revisiting um, this space and where we find our kuleana. They, they mentioned that quite often, Kuleana in Hawaiian is responsibility. Um, whereas in Western terminology, responsibility could sound very, um, uh, you know, um, as as a burden. Um, in Hawaiian culture, Kuleana or this this understanding of responsibility is it's your drive, it's your meaning, it's your purpose. Uh, when we find what that is, it then changes and shifts what we need to do. For the most part, I, what I've understood and recognized is that uh, most people don't know who they are and they don't know what they want. And before they can even be, begin to heal, they have to get to those two sources first. Uh, we have dealt with so much trauma um, and so many historical uh, attributes that, that have been 
have shaped a lot of the ways we think, the, the way we look at, at things, the perspectives. Uh, it has shaped our, you know, even our experiences to an extent because that's all we know. When we move away from that and refocus who we, on who we are and our kuleana, it changes everything. It changes uh, our purpose in life. And we get to know our why. And if you folks could hear their laughter, I had these grown women and I'm driving a 15 passenger van I, and I can hear them in the back. Grown women with kids and families and trauma, like things that have happened to them um, that were unbelievable. But you could hear them laugh. If you've ever hear, heard children laugh in safety and feeling secure, that's what they sounded like. That was their joy. Uh, we were able to provide a space, and that's kind of what a kahupono does, provide space so that one can be feel, feel secure and safe to be free, to just be free. And as she said, be is. And that was our theme throughout the whole uh, six weeks. They're currently on their second cohort. They wanted to do it again. And we didn't have funding, but we were like, no, this is going to happen no matter what. What do you need? Let's just do it. And uh, they do their, they do their whole ike or their, um, at the end, they do a, they show, share their experience with their community. So this initiative provides immediate cultural healing and prevention activities to assist individuals and communities in recovering from the effects of natural human caused disasters. Uh, we deeply believe in um, our EMS, our emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. And we were able to work with um, SAMHSA as well as um, other um, uh, Department of um, Health to have crisis counselors. And it, what we learned was the community didn't want to hear there were crisis counselors amongst them. So we, I changed their name to Ulu. And the reason for that was because in uh, Lahaina, it happened to be a place that was known for its ulu tree. And the ulu was known for protection. It wasn't only for food, the breadfruit to eat. It was also a place that somebody could rest their head underneath a tree before they went on their journey. It was a place to have shade so that people, you know, so they could get out of the sun. And so with that metaphor, we use the word ulu as our crisis counselor, giving people space to feel relieved, even if it was for just a little while. And so we were able to work with the uh, community and have crisis counselors on hand to, to listen to them and just listen. That was the key to everything. Uh, it wasn't about advising. It wasn't about you know bringing up our own personal experiences. It was just to listen. And so um, we were able to work with other community members in um, on in Maui, and we were able to bring them. The, a lot of the Lahaina folks came to Molokai. We we're such a close knit community. Um, we're literally right across the ocean, the channel, and we can see Lahaina every day, and the Lahaina can see us. And we have this relationship with Lahaina, and so a lot of the families came back to Molokai uh, to start either to uh, live until they could get their homes recovered or to start fresh and brand new. And, you know, our children were dealing with a lot of issues in school, um, you know, through bullying and um, not understanding now what was going on in the community. It was really sad. And so we were there for the kum kumu, we were there for the keiki, we were there for the ohana. Uh, our kumus didn't know, our teachers did not know how to work with the, uh, those who were in um, who were transferred over in this from the from Lahaina to the schools, our, our poor teachers did not know how to address uh, some of the things that were coming up. So we were there to help and and be alongside them. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not gonna go over all of this. This is a lot, um, but you know, we had to deal with a lot of. Um, observations. And so things had, sh had to shift really quickly and we were open to shifts. And the reason for that was because we nobody knew uh, and nobody had uh, an understanding of how to deal with something this catastrophic. 
And so what I did was I started to observe how um, our Ulu were, our crisis counselors, along with the folks in, um, in Lahaina. And so aside from the things that we could assume that would happen in a crisis, uh, to actually be in it uh, was a very different point of view. Actually be in it with Native Hawaiians on their Native Hawaiian lands, along with the many historical trauma, was a different point of view. Uh, no, I don't think anybody would have expected some of the things that we observed. Um, next slide, please. Um, there was an ever-changing shift. There were ever-changing uh, movement within all of this. Um, the numbers on the side, it's really tiny. Um, can't really see it, but you know, some of the things that came up were the reports of suicides within the spaces uh, there and how they were undocumented as um, they were, when I say that they weren't documented or they weren't, they, they weren't public. Um, and a lot of that information came from working with the families and actually witnessing some of these ourselves or even having those phone calls come in um, as, with, as crisis counselors. And so we were able to gather enough information to kind of come up with these numbers and you know, honestly, the reason why, because we had we had done some more research, the reason why uh, they weren't reporting these suicides in Lahaina were because they couldn't specifically say that it was because of the fires. And so it was really hard for us, the families or anybody to accept that that was the truth. Uh, but it was important for us to continue forward. Like, if that was their truth, we're going to move forward because... Our fight is not them right now. Our fight is for the health and well-being of our people. And so we continued working with them. Uh, we did do more research in regards to how many calls came in, how many times there were ideations. And so because of the extent of the fire, we were not able to um, come up with a conclusion that uh, that the state was willing to, to share uh, their information with us because there was it was inconclusive uh, that it was not directly for the fires, that it could be indirectly because of the fires. So very hard, right? So we're, we're but we're going to focus on our kuleana, our, our responsibilities. We're going to focus on the culture. We're going to focus on the things that matter. And we're going to focus on um, working with our families. And I just want to leave off with um, a quote from one of our ladies. As Wahine are our women, we are in deep need of cultural resilience through these touch times. We have learned on our counterparts for far too long and leaned on our, car on our counterparts for far too long and the journey to stand once again in our bodies and our mana, our power is a gift. And um, that is, to hear something like that is so powerful. When when I first got the women and they were they were just a loss for words. They were angry. They were mad. Um, they didn't understand. They lost everything. They lost their history. They lost their memories. Uh, they lost their homes. They lost family members. They lost their pets. It was it was rough and. Um, I just wanted to put that out there as a means to, to know that these things, we're doing our best to help our families and we're doing our best and we're doing it through culture and culture has been working as a means to health and well-being, our Maoli Ola, our optimal health. So mahalo. And I believe that is our last slide. Oh, one more. To, okay. We do have Mo'olelo. The other thing too I want to um, acknowledge is healing our healers. Let us not forget to heal our healers. Uh, we tend to uh, look at our superheroes to go out there and do the job. Don't forget that they need healing too. Amongst the uh, crisis counselors that I had, in all transparency, um, the amount of suicides and ideations that they had to deal with, it triggered one of my ulu who also had ideation at a younger age, it triggered her. And I had one who actually had ideation. And that is 
saying a lot. Uh, how do we take care of our healers? How do we take care of our crisis counselors? How do we take care of our workers? Because they need help too. And uh, they're required to culturally go jump in the ocean or be sprinkled with wa um, salt water. That's a pikai, we call it, um, once a week. They're required to. And the, the reason for that is because I need them to be as full as possible, as full as possible when they go to work. And uh, they can't do that if they do not take care of themselves. And so, yes, they, they get scoldings if they don't go, um, but it's important that they do. And um, the indirect approaches of healing is absolutely helpful. As she had shared, being in the Kalo patch, in the Taro patch, uh, that was an indirect approach to healing. Um, and, and, you know, it's important to create the healers in the community. So our women of Ho'inana are now the next leaders of healers within their community. Instead of us, we have to deal with this colonizer mentality all the time. People coming in who want to save you. People want to come in and say that they're, they're going to come and do all these great things for you. Our method is I would rather find the person in your community and give them the tools that they need to be the best them that they could be for the rest of their community. So um, those are some of the things I wanted to share with you folks. And um, I think that's it. Is it one more slide? Yeah, and then we do, and I know they're gonna share this with you folks. We do have best practices. These are some of the things that came up uh, during this work that we wanted to document. And this is part of um, Ohana Center of Excellence. So this will also be, uh, something that they'll have access to. And uh, I hope that you take a look at it. These are all things that we learned during this work. And it's not over. We're going to continue learning and we're going to continue uh, building uh, our support and resources and our best practices. So if you are interested, we do have, um, in connecting, we do have another six-week course of this same that what you had just witnessed, but more on a broader scale for those outside of Lahaina. We're learning that folks want to use, utilize culture as their healing medicine. And so we do have a course coming up soon. Feel free to use the QR code uh, or visit us at our Hoakama. Mahalo. Thank you, Kanoilani. Um... I'm going to uh, thank you so much. I, I hope that you and um, Illinois are able to look at all the comments that came in. Um, they're really wonderful. I'm going to we're going to move on now to um, the next two presentations. We have two more presentations for the remainder of the time, um, which means we probably won't have much time for a QA and a um, so that we can close. Certainly appreciate all the wisdom that was shared and really appreciate um, the deep um, I think the deep work that people are doing that's really informative for everyone. I want everyone to take a breath. I think a lot of what has been covered um, is really bittersweet, meaningful, um, as well as um, difficult. Um, but thank you um, both for all of your sharing and your wisdom and expertise. So um, we're now going to um, we're going to have a different format for um, the the next one, which is with um, John Oliver and Kamila Luke, who are um, with the Hawaii State Department of Health. Um, in Maui County. Um, and so I'm going to be moderating a discussion with them. And, um, and in, in efforts to save time, I'm going to jump straight to the, the questions. And so let's have um, John and Kamile on camera um, so that we can um, ha have them answer some questions. But I'll start with the questions first as they get you on camera. Um, so um, we can't talk about culturally relevant service delivery in Maui without talking about the devastating Maui wildfires that occurred in August. Uh, the trauma and devastation that occurred in the fire is almost impossible to understand. We've heard a lot about it um, from the first two presentations. Um, what was needed by the AANHPI community in the immediate aftermath um, of the fire? You can speak to that. Aloha, Kathy, and um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us, us on here. And so, um, as you said, I'm John Oliver with the State of Hawaii Department of Health. And really, you know, what we experienced as far as what was needed immediately uh, was pretty much everything. Individuals, as we saw, they had to quickly leave their homes. Uh, there was a fast moving fire. And uh, within just a few short hours, pretty much uh, people had lost everything that they had. So often they just left with uh, uh, 
sometimes even without their shoes on to flee. So they didn't have any other documents. They didn't have any papers. So uh, there was just enormous need uh, in addition to the trauma that they had just experienced. So, um, yeah, so this slide just kind of shows, just kind of just give an idea. You've seen lots of different pictures on, on the news, but just kind of a before and after to sort of see what, uh, what this might look like, I guess, for someone as far as from what they experienced one day to the next. So, um, a whole new reality. Uh, so I guess, Kamali, what else would you have? I guess that they needed. I think since we are talking about culture, the biggest need was understanding and having cultural empathy. I think as Lilinoi and um, Konoi both shared, Lahaina is, uh, there are a lot of Native Hawaiians, Kanakamoli, and mental health is not something that in Hawaii um, we talk about very often, not in our ohanas, not in the households that we grew up in. And so having folks, behavioral health folks respond who are aware of those barriers was really important. Shiko, next slide, please. Great. And um, I, I forgot to mention during the introduction that you both work with um, the Department of Health's, um, Hawaii's Department of Health's Maui County Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, which we'll refer to as the CCBHC, right? And here's your staff here. So you can go ahead and talk about them. And um, we'll talk about how, what sort of strategies that you, you used and the partnerships um, and community outreach that you did. Absolutely. So, you know, I love this photo. This is one of the photos that we took just throughout, I guess, the first few months, as far as this is at our uh, Lahaina Comprehensive Health Center, um, in which our our Maui Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic operates. So, um, and, you know, this, has, this is some CCBHC stuff, but really this kind of speaks to what the whole community needed. It was a collaborative effort as far as having individuals from all over Hawaii and all over the continent came to support us and we're truly grateful. So for example, here we have represented uh, as far as our district health office for Maui County, we have um, our Department of Health Behavioral Health Administration here. We also have uh, members of our Native Hawaiian Health uh, collaborative, collaborative organizations, including the, uh, the HUI, and we have like Waianae Conference of Health Center that came from Oahu. And so we have federally qualified health centers. We just have uh, volunteers. There's just everyone came together with one single purpose, which is really just to support and to kind of provide wraparound services to our impacted um, Maui community. Great. Um, I'm going to jump to the next question and maybe um, Kamile can inform us a little given your experiences of being hired there. So what strategies have you used to build a workforce that is responsive to the unique needs of the population that you're serving? Um, and you're cognizant, of course, of the cultural and historical context. I know that, Kamali, you shared a little bit about your being hired um, what, and what it's like to work there in terms of that. So would you mind sharing that? Yeah. So I actually, when I was first hired and I interviewed with John, one of the first questions he asked me was, am I from Maui and do I have any connection to Lahaina? And I thought that was a really important question to ask, given how um, incredibly close that community was. I spent most of my childhood in Lahaina. My mom was a radio host um, for a really long time on a Hawaiian music radio station. And so when I first got on board, John was really um, specific about having those connections to Lahaina. And when I first got here too, one of the first people I met was um, Auntie Mary, who works for Adult Mental Health Division. And so I think the hiring process really speaks volumes because you are a ohana. So many people that I've come across are family members or friends. And so in being the clinic coordinator and hiring moving forward, um, one of the things that we really look for is people who have a connection to Lahaina or also have the desire and the empathy to want to embrace Lahaina and be open-minded that our clinic operates on a very much uh, ohana and aloha level. When you walk into the clinic, there's usually Hawaiian music playing. There's a lot of laughing at the front desk. You might hear it in this presentation. Um, so it feels like a home and not like a clinic. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Anything you want to add to that, John, about the workforce and about yeah, so I guess, you know, we, we look at our partnerships and our strategies as far as, as being a certified community behavioral health clinic and trying to really address sort of 
you know, a much greater need than what we had anticipated when we first began our journey um, and piloting Hawaii's first CCPHC. So, you know, I guess uh, this slide sort of shows, you know, we had, this is the first contingent of members of the Mission Corps of the USPHS that came in August. And, you know, it was wonderful having their support as far as having individuals that came from all over, um, from, from Hawaii, as well as from the continent and uh, to provide support to, to everyone here. And next slide, please. You know, as far as our strategies, we, we really try to incorporate what people love here. And, you know, one of, the, one of those things is actually pineapple. So, you know, we, we had individuals that donated different resources to us. We then um, tailored as far as our approach to working with the community at the different hotel shelters as far as to, instead of doing typical wellness checks with just like a clipboard, we would actually go and bring these carts that were donated by Hawaiian Airlines. And, and we had it loaded with different fresh produce and healthy snacks for individuals as far as something that they were lacking oftentimes when they were um, at their stays. So uh, next slide, please. And just a closer up, uh, view again of these carts. So you can imagine going down the hall of the hotel and we, uh, I believe it was Queens Medical, and they actually had the idea of putting bicycle bells on them. So we had that going. So it's almost like the ice cream truck coming by. And so people were more willing to come out. And it was really just about engaging the community at a time when people tended to want to more isolate, which, you know, could be very damaging after a trauma like this. So it's just trying to get people to come out, to engage, to eat, to, um, to enjoy just, uh, just even simple pleasures. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, it's also very important for us in our, our strategies is to try to create tailored uh, workshops that would actually speak more to the community. And uh, Kamali, you want to talk about this, I guess. Um, yeah, so when I first got on board and I saw the first attempt flyer, um, <laughs> I was a little bit concerned about how that was going to be received. Um, being somebody from Maui, I was, it, it was just, it felt like a barrier. Um, and when talking to John and actually one of our therapists, Lori, we really, talk to John about it having to be something that is culturally um, embracing. And as a little kid and as even an adult, you go to Minute Stop in Hawaii and you get a musubi and you get a green tea and maybe some chicken and a potato wedge. And so when John was talking about doing groups, we really wanted to embrace the people of Lahaina. Um, and Minute Stop was actually one of the first places to reopen. So you can imagine being in a hotel where there's no there's no way to cook food. A um, minute stop really did become kind of a gathering place to go get that, those snacks. And um, I am not advertising minute stop, but it was just a very pivotal place where people were gathered. And so when we were talking about how to have people connect, it really was food. It was being able to have conversation and it not be seen as um, something really scary and, and clinical. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to jump to the last question. Um, so um, we're here today with so many leaders, community-based organizations, and ANHPIs who may not be connected to any organizations. Um, what are a few key takeaways you want folks here to know about your experience of, of your work, um, as well as your collaboration with community and with each other? What advice do you have? I guess, especially for this presentation, I mean, I would just say that it's really important to know your community and to really focus on its diversity. You know, I, I think when we look at when we look at Maui in general and we look at Lahaina, you know, it's it's made up extensively with Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and so understanding that it each culture approaches healing differently and really trying to embrace those differences. So. I, I think as, as a leader for me, it's, it's it's trying to act as a bridge across systems and cultures. As far as it's in showing that learning is bi-directional, we can learn from each other's cultures and we can take pieces of it that mean something to us and apply them in our own lives. So uh, just really celebrate diversity and 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 embrace it. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, um, I definitely agree with what John has to say is knowing the community and knowing the community that you serve 
that's so important because if you go into that not knowing, you within itself create barriers and that makes it a lot more difficult to have healing and to be able to reach folks who may not have the, um, you know, the resources to do so, especially in Lahaina and also to be in touch with the community because even though we are nine months after the fires, we are still doing outreach in the hotels. We are still going into re-entry with families into the burn zones. We have more, more of our Ohana seeking services nine months later and remembering that it is still prevalent even though it's been nine months. So I think the biggest takeaway is that this is still very real for a lot of our Ohanas and a lot of our staff here. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, John and uh, Kamali. Um, we will, um, you, I would love you to, for you to look at the chat also um, in the comments that have gone by as you've been speaking. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing, um, Mahalo. Um, we're now going to move quickly to our last presentation um, by Nikki Wright and I'm really looking forward to it. I know again that a lot of this material is very um, difficult, um, really heartwarming as well as heartbreaking. And so again, we welcome you, Nikki. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you, Kathleen. Aloha, everyone. My name is Nikki Wright, and I work for the oldest and largest of the federally qualified health centers in our state. Almost 50% of our patient population is Native Hawaiian, followed by Pacific Islanders and Asian Americans. I am deeply honored to be here today with these amazing healthcare champions who are spearheading some truly pioneering work in Hawaii. I wanna start out by thanking SAMHSA for honoring Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center as one of the first 10 Behavioral Health Equity Challenge recipients last year. Thank you for the incredible recognition and also for the opportunity today to share our journey in healthcare innovation during Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Today, I'm here to discuss how integrating cultural education and activities into traditional medicine has transformed our healthcare delivery and outcomes, specifically in addressing a different crisis in Hawaii, the addiction crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Here is our main campus. It sits on five acres of land on the west coast on the island of Oahu. Our organization was founded as a response to a healthcare crisis in the 1970s. There were no other healthcare facilities for miles from our community. When our Native Hawaiian residents traveled out of the community for health care, they were often refused services. So our health center started as a one doctor office and grew in the next five decades to what you see before you, plus five satellite clinics on our West Coast. I am director of two of the clinical departments in three different clinics. Malama Recovery Services is an intensive outpatient substance use disorder treatment program, and Ho'okuolahale is an integrated chronic pain management department. Next slide, please. Here is the building where our chronic pain management program is housed on the main campus. We work in the most beautiful place in the world. Of course, I'm a little biased because I get to stare out of my office window every day at work directly at the beach. Next slide, please. Seriously, we have some of the most beautiful beaches in the world on the West Coast on the island, on the island of Oahu. Uh, this is a picture taken directly across from my clinic by my brother. I'll give you a second to absorb some of the beauty. And yet, next slide we have some of the sickest people in our state residing in our service area. Our service area is comprised of almost 50,000 residents with some of the highest rates of chronic diseases and the lowest per capita income in the state with, next point please, high rates of unfortunate situation, situations such as infant mortality deaths in our state. Next slide. Uh, as we can see from this slide, just keep going through, yep, stop there. Uh, the mental health and substance use statistics among Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders are quite alarming. Despite the high prevalence of mental illness and substance use disorders, service utilization remains low. Next slide. Uh, there was a news report in April of last year with the title, Alarming Figures Show Hawaii Set New Record Last Year for Fentanyl Drug overdoses. Now, looking at these numbers on this slide, especially if you're from another state, this doesn't look too bad. 
There were over 80,000 opioid overdose deaths just last year in 2023 in the United States, which is like 200 people dying per day or a standard 747 plane full of people dying every two to three days. So just looking at this slide, Hawaii looks like we're in pretty good shape. However, due to Hawaii's location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, drug trends typically hit us about five to eight years after whatever is going on in the other states. So it's like we have a crystal ball into the future to warn us about what issues could be affecting our state when it comes to drugs. Now, the numbers, again, might look pretty low to those of you on the webinar, but there was actually a 700% increase in opioid overdose deaths in Hawaii between 2018 to 2022. So I hope that helps to put these numbers into perspective and let you understand that in Hawaii, we are in the midst of a crisis when it comes to opioid use disorder. Next slide, please. Our health center opened its own intensive outpatient substance use disorder treatment program in 1994. This was in response to the crystal methamphetamine crisis of the 90s. We actually had so many people in our community using meth. At one point in the early 2000s, we had the highest number of people addicted to meth per capita. So we earned the nickname, the meth capital of the country, not one of our proudest moments. And in 2017, we opened our integrated chronic pain management department as our health center's response to the growing opioid crisis. So our health center has a demonstrated history of responding to the crises affecting our service area. For Malama Recovery Services, it took us almost two decades to develop our evidence-based practices and our sound workflows we collected outcome measures during that time, and we were able to achieve higher rates of success than national and state averages in regards to long-term recovery for our graduate graduates. But we wanted to increase our positive outcomes even further. So we partnered with a cultural educator, Kumu Makani Tabura, who is pictured on the far left on this slide. Uh, and he developed and implemented for us an eight-week cultural curriculum to accompany our evidence-based program. And we found within a very short period of time, 12 months, we were, we were able to improve our positive outcomes for our clients by over 25% just by incorporating cultural education and activities. Next slide, please. So when we opened our integrated chronic pain management department, we learned from that previous experience, the importance of cultural practices and made sure to include our two cultural educators in every aspect of our program plan. They attend our weekly clinical treatment team meetings. We consult with them about all of our clinical workflows and they are intimately involved in each client's treatment plan and overall medical care. Next slide, please. This is actually a kahili that was made by our clients in culture class. It's a traditional symbol of Hawaiian royalty. So for the first two years of our chronic pain program, we served 1,488 patients in 15,660 encounters, and we found a significant reduction in low acuity ED visits, emergency room visits, and we were also able to significantly reduce patients' opioid doses to safe levels of opioid use. And probably our biggest accomplishment since opening our doors in 2017, I didn't list this on the slide, we have had zero opioid overdose deaths to date. Next slide, please. Uh, as more programs incorporate cultural education and practices into their medical programs, we're finding that insurance companies are noticing not only the health and healing ramifications of culture, but also how cost-effective they can be. So in 2022, Aloha Care was the first insurance plan in our state to reimburse for Native Hawaiian healing practices, and now other insurance companies are following suit. Next slide, please. So all the stats and numbers and news coverage is great for positive feedback for our programs. However, I'm most interested in what our patients have to say. Here is some anonymous feedback that we've gathered from some of our clients from last year, specifically about our cultural curriculum. Uh, this gentleman said, I was empty, something was missing inside me until I figured out who I am and where I came from, from culture class. This other woman said, Makani and Kupu, our two cultural educators, showed me there's a different way to live life. 
Uh, this client said, fear is not an effective motivator. An another client said, I cool is someone I can talk to. Next slide, please. We have a couple more comments. Uh, my Kumu talked to my girl. My Kumu believes in me. He gave me hope. And learning about my culture makes me feel better. Um, I teach college classes, and I know how important it is to get everybody out on time. So I'm going to cut the rest of my slide short and just let you know that um, thank you for letting us share today. I hope to, what we shared today inspires you to get out there and innovate and heal with heart and use some cultural practices to promote healing. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about our programs, here's my contact information. Mahalo for your time. Thank you so much, Nikki, for sharing the incredible work um, that you are doing and that all of your staff are doing. Unbelievable. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters today. I'm going to turn it over quickly to Corey. I do want to remind everyone that if this session has brought up feelings for you and um, as well as um, has really um, hit you very uh, in, a, in a way that's very challenging, we encourage you, of course, to seek a support and services um, for yourselves as well as for other people who are attending this. I'm going to turn it over to Corey very quickly. Again, thank you to all, mahalo to all of our presenters. This has been an incredible session. Go ahead, Corey. Thank you um, for that, Kathy. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, it's both May Heritage Month as well as May Mental Health Awareness Month, which is just right on theme for our discussion today. Um, as we close the session, I just want to express my appreciation to the panelists and our facilitator today. A uh, special thank you to Assistant Secretary Dr. Delpin Rittman for the opening remarks, and of course, uh, the Ohana Center of Excellence, Office of Behavioral Health Equity, and contract staff for uh, working behind the scenes to make this webinar happen today. Um, we would love to hear your input about this event in the chat. There's going to be a feedback survey link. It's very brief. If you could help us out and, and give, let us know, you know, what, what you think of the event. Um, we also want to share that if you're on social media, you can follow the organizations, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, we have the two hashtags, uh, hashtag AANHPI Heritage Month and hashtag SAMHSA Equity 2024. Um, and following these hashtags will link to various behavioral health resources as well. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Uh, we'll be sharing related resources, the video recording um, uh, once available on the Ohana and NED websites. <laughs>